my name is Sam. I am a research scientist at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing. And today, I'm pleased to talk to you about our recent work on topological data analysis. Oh, yeah, okay. Other way around. All set. You know, got to keep things you know, invariant under symmetries. So this work was done in collaboration between our team and Andras Gillian at the Rainey Institute in Hungary. And before I dive into the details of topological data analysis and describe how our algorithm for the problem works, I first want to briefly introduce our quantum algorithms team and some of the things we've been working on over the last couple of years. So the mission of our team is to work backwards from customer problems to deliver meaningful quantum speedups. What this means is that we go out and talk to our customers in industry and academia, and then we understand what their problems and pain points are. And then we work on developing and optimizing quantum algorithms such that they give practical advantages for these problems. So I've listed here a selection of problems that we've worked on over the last couple of years. Many of these works were done in collaboration with our partners in industry and academia. And you can see that we have a wide range of interests that spans a really broad range of topics within quantum algorithms, specifically focused on quantum algorithms within the fault-tolerant error-corrected regime, as this is where we expect quantum computers to offer the most benefit in the future. Our team is predominantly based at the Center for Quantum Computing in Pasadena, located on the Caltech campus. And we are gradually growing our team over time. So if you have a strong background and interest in quantum algorithms, please grab me for a chat later. Um, I'll just be at the AWS booth in the main hall. So we're now ready to dive a little bit deeper into the details of topological data analysis. Now I'll say now that topological data analysis is not a silver bullet for data problems in the same way that neural networks or like principal component analysis are. Nevertheless, in the hands of skilled practitioners, it can be a very powerful tool for extracting insights from complex or high dimensional data. In essence, what topological data analysis does is to extract some notion of the shape of the data. And it can be applied to a really wide range of problems. So you can have scenarios where you really care what the topological features of your data are. For example, if I'm running large simulations of how matter is distributed in the universe, then I do care explicitly about what my topological features are telling me. On the other hand, I can consider scenarios where the extracted topological features don't have an obvious interpretation to us, but we still find that they are good descriptors from the data from the perspective of, um, you know, we can cluster using these features. Um, an example of this is in this paper I show here, using topological data analysis to analyze uh, MRI brain scans. So before I tell you a bit more about topological data analysis and how it works, I first want us to have this kind of picture in our mind about what data analysis is doing. We have some potentially complicated high dimensional data set and we want to extract just simple descriptions of it and ideally, we want to offload that task to a computer. So I give an example here, uh, inspired by this blog post, of a data set that is very easy for us as humans to analyze. I could give this to a small child, and we often do, and they would tell me that you know, my data set here, my dots, have arisen from a simple descriptor, which is that they came from a picture of a face. But we can take a step back and ask, how do we as humans come to this sort of conclusion? So the steps that we kind of follow, and apologies to any you know, neuroscientists in the audience whose research I'm butchering, but uh, you know, the kind of way we look at this problem is we connect the dots together using some notion of locality to form this image in the middle. And then given that image, we can identify some objects. We've got two small circles, a small semicircle, and the large circle. And then we as humans interpret these as features based on our you know, day to day experiences eyes, a mouth, and a head. And then we infer that these features together are often you know, 
characteristics of a face, and so we say that the data points came from a face. These last two steps are pretty hard for computers, interpretation and inference. In general, we need to train on a lot of data to be able to do that. But what about the earlier steps? So it turns out identifying these objects that I've talked about is actually quite easy to get a computer to do in an unsupervised manner. In particular, if rather than caring about geometric features like circles and semicircles, I just ask the computer to identify topological features. So do I have a closed loop or do I have an open set of connected points like a line? And it's these topological features, closed loops and their higher dimensional generalizations that we're trying to extract using topological data analysis because we believe that they're good representations of the underlying data. But what about that first step that I talked about? Rewinding even further, how do we go from this you know, notion of just having dots to this image that has um, some objects in it that we want to extract? So as I say, we as humans are very good at just looking at this kind of picture and intuitively knowing what the length scale should be for connecting the points together. But computers don't have that same intuition. So the way that they have to address the problem is by just connecting the dots at a whole range of length scales. So if the length scale is set too small, and I've just you know, done the connections here by growing each data point according to the length scale, and when the data points overlap, you can say that the points are connected. So when the length scale is small, you can see that there's a lot of gaps in my image, and I've not got the right number of loops anymore. When the length scale is too large, you know, it's a complete mess. Again, we don't have the correct number of loops. And in the middle, there's some happy medium where I've set the length scale correctly, such that I've got the right number of loops for my problem. But again, how are we supposed to know a priori what this length scale should be? It's hard to work at just a single length scale. Even more problematically, in a real world application, we'll have noise. The effect of noise is to um, perturb the positions of the data points. And you can see that this gives birth to you know, spurious artificial noise induced loops. That means if we count the number of loops in the problem, we'll get the wrong answer back and classify our data incorrectly. So the solution to both these problems is to not work at just a single length scale and compute the number of loops there. But instead, we look at our data across a whole range of length scales, starting from a very small length scale where no data points are connected to each other, and then gradually growing the length scale, adding more and more connections until all of the points are connected to each other and the topological features disappear. And if we do this, we'll find that topological features are gradually created and then later destroyed as we progress through the length scales. And we can track the topological features through the complex. So you can see here that I've plotted this idea of how long the topological features last. And this is an object known as a persistence barcode. So the dominant topological features we find live for a very long time, as opposed to the noise induced features which pop in and out of existence very quickly. And it's these kind of barcodes that we're trying to extract from topological data analysis. They allow us to just read off you know, what the do dominant topological features are. I could look at this and say, my diagram basically consists of four loops. And then I can compare this persistence barcode to that taken from other data sets. For example, if I looked at a lot of pictures of faces, I'd probably find that the barcodes are similar across them and very different to persistence barcodes taken from pictures of hands, for example. And obviously this is a very simplified example, but you can imagine applying this in much higher dimensions where we as humans struggle to do these kind of calculations. So the underlying mathematical task that we're trying to solve then is to ask how many potentially high dimensional loops survive from a short length scale A to a longer length scale B. And this is known within topological data analysis as persistent homology. And I should stress that in a quantum algorithm, this is a much harder calculation than just asking how many holes are there at a single length scale. In fact, you can't just ask how many, length scale, how many holes do I have at length scale B, how many holes do I have at length scale A, and take the difference between the two. The reason being is that the number of holes does not uniquely identify what the holes are. As I increase the length scale, new holes might have been created, old holes might have been destroyed, so really what you have to do is have some notion of what the holes are at the short length scale and then track them through to the longer length scale by looking at both length scales at the same time. 
This comes very naturally to classical algorithms for this task, but it's much harder for quantum algorithms to do. And we spent significant time in this project really understanding how to do that best. So classical algorithms for this problem follow a pipeline. Um, like I say, we assume that our data is sampled from some underlying topological manifold whose invariance we wish to calculate. We then set our length scales and create this connectivity graph by connecting together points if they're within the length scale of each other. We then build what is known as a scaffold for the underlying topological manifold by adding cliques into the graph. So the name for this scaffold is a simpler Schull complex, and I'll talk about this a bit more later. So when I say we add cliques into the graph, I mean that we add in objects like this and their convex hull. They're like you know, solid objects. So these are just uh, collections of data points that are mutually connected to each other because they're within a length scale of each other. So data points, lines, triangles, tetrahedra, and their higher dimensional generalizations. And the reason we introduce these objects to act as a, a scaffold for our underlying manifold is because it allows us to convert what is a topological problem into a problem of linear algebra. It turns out that if we promote these simplices to vectors in a vector space, we can build up uh, linear operators that act in this vector space and that can actually encode what are the holes and how many of them we have. And the number of holes is just encoded within eigenspaces of certain operators known as boundary operators that map a simplex to their boundary in the dimension below. Um, the intuition for this is that if you think of what a hole is, it's a region of empty space with a boundary. So if we can identify these kinds of boundaries, then we're going to be able to count the number of holes. Now the problem is that the number of simplices that you have, the dimension of your vector space, and thus the matrices you have to work with, grows very rapidly with the number of data points and the dimension that you work in. In fact, it grows combinatorially, as shown here. And this is often a big data application. N can be very large in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions. K, on the other hand, the dimension is often much smaller, typically two or three, which one, makes these computations feasible classically, and also allows us to you know, interpret what the topological features are telling us. We as humans are very used to working in low dimensions. But as I say, these high dimensional vector spaces we have to work in make these calculations very challenging for classical devices. But working with these very large matrices is something that we believe quantum computers may be able to help with. And this then motivates using quantum algorithms to solve this problem. So quantum algorithms have been known for topological data analysis for a few years now. The original paper by Seth Lloyd and co-authors came out a little while ago. And that work and subsequent generalizations really focused on just calculating the holes at a single length scale. As I say, that is a slightly easier problem to solve. There was a paper last year from Ryu Hayakawa at the Yukawa Institute in Japan that was the first to be able to calculate holes across multiple length scales and track their persistence. And it's that work that we kind of follow on from here. So our quantum algorithm has two main steps. The first is that we need to build a quantum state that represents this scaffold, this simplicial complex that approximates the underlying topological manifold. And we can just do this very simply using Grover's algorithm. We have a simple criteria for determining if a simplex should be in the complex or not, and it's that you know, all the data points should be within the length scale of each other. And then we can simply, as I say, use Grover's algorithm to find these simplices. Now, a development that we had in our paper was that we used a novel encoding method for this problem. We encode simplices by using a small quantum register for each of the vertices. And those registers use a logarithmic number of qubits. Um, well, the number of qubits used scales logarithmically with the number of data points because we just enumerate the uh, vertices using binary. So this is in contrast to previous quantum algorithms that we're using a qubit per data point. So if you have n data points, you need n qubits. And this exponential space saving is vitally important if you ever want to use this algorithm for big data applications. If I've got a million data points in my problem, previous approaches would have used <clears throat> a million logical qubits. Our approach would use around 80 if you considered working in three dimensions. And this you know, huge space saving is going to be vitally important. The next step of the algorithm is just to encode the number of persistent holes uh, into the quantum state somehow. 
The way we do that is to take the state representing our simplicial complex and project it down into the uh, subspace of the Hilbert space that contains the persistent holes between the short length scale and the long length scale. So I unfortunately don't really have time to go into the details of how this happened. Um, the approach we use is known as the quantum singular value transformation, which is a very powerful framework for realizing many quantum algorithms, and in particular, the kind of non-unitary transformations between subspaces that we used in this work. So what then happens is that the number of persistent holes divided by the number of simplices in the complex, and this normalization factor turns out to be crucially important, gets encoded as the amplitude of your quantum state, and then you can just read this out using quantum amplitude estimation. So our algorithm has a few key features that I'll like state now to finish up. So as I say, it solves the practical problem. That's really what we were trying to do here. It's the first quantum algorithm in topological data analysis that's really applicable in this big data regime because of the exponential space saving of our new encoding. And in addition, not only do we use this encoding for our data qubits, but you can also get away with using a very small quantum memory or QRAM so you don't have the data input problem that some other quantum machine learning algorithms have. As I say, we're also the second quantum algorithm to compute length uh, holes across multiple length scales, which is the important problem to solve classically because of the effects of noise and not knowing what length scale you should set the calculation at. Because of our streamlining of the algorithm, we obtained significant polynomial speed ups over the previous algorithm that was also able to solve this task. Finally, like a key take home message, I think, from this talk and this work in general, is that our quantum algorithm, and in fact, no quantum algorithms for topological data analysis, can achieve exponential speed up for this problem or should be expected to. The reason for this is this normalization that I talked about before. When you get the number of holes back, you get the number of holes divided by the number of simplices in the complex. That will be a very large number, so what you measure will be very, very small. Therefore, you need to measure it to high precision. And when you crank through all the machinery, you find that that effectively undoes the topological speed up and limits you much closer to smaller polynomial speed ups. So unfortunately, that's all I have time for today. Um, if you want to hear any more of the details, as I say, I'll be at the AWS booth for the next couple of hours. But yeah, thank you very much for listening. And got time for a couple on this one. So the classical algorithms, because of the running time, can only go up to, you know, k equals 1, 2, or 3, if you really want to try it. Do you think there's information that is there for larger, you know, Betty numbers, let's say, where we could, you know, expect, uh, like, a large polynomial gap between the quantum and the classical algorithm? Like, w is the information just on the small numbers, or w do you think there's more that we don't capture with the classical algorithm? Yeah, so if, if we restrict ourselves to like an absolute error in the number of holes, like a constant precision, then we're still limited to quite small polynomial speed ups, even as we go to larger dimensions, in particular when we compare against heuristic classical algorithms for this problem, it kind of looks like we'll be stuck with a quadratic speed up, even at higher dimensions. The question changes a bit if we allow ourselves to go to relative error and to consider systems in higher dimensions that could potentially have a, a large number of holes. And some other works that came out at a similar time to our paper looked in these sorts of settings at graphs that might have high holes. But it kind of seems from the maths literature that this is not the norm, and we shouldn't be expecting this to be the case. Certainly, if you look at um, random complexes that you could get by you know, randomly positioning points in space, even in high dimensions, we would not expect these complexes to have very large holes. And therefore, it kind of seems unlikely that um, we would expect this to be commonplace in practical applications, and we wouldn't see large speed ups as a result. Mm -hmm.